So uh, two weeks ago, we started this chapter in becoming more like Christ and started right off with some of the uh, uh, thoughts here that uh, I don't know why these are. I'm not sure what happened to that. Hang on just a second. Why are these all out of order, brother? Do you know? But that's okay, because I'll, it's good, because I think it's right where I left off, so it's actually pretty good, so I'll just leave it there. We talked about uh, some of the objectives that we want to accomplish in this. We're not going to go back and necessarily talk about all these, other than the fact that if I could just hone in on this one thought, we need to constantly be, in, be saturated by the Word of God, in constant exposure to the things of God. And the more that we are exposed to the things of God, then obviously that is going to have wonderful consequences as we continue to come into contact with those attributes that we talked about a couple weeks ago, those, those non-communicable attributes that he doesn't share with anyone, but yet we see them in the aspect of omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence and transcendence and eternal and all of these things. And we, we came to the conclusion that when we think about those attributes in light of us, what we came to the conclusion is, isn't our God an awesome God? Our God is just amazingly awesome. And when we come into the presence of that awesomeness, it can't but have a wonderful effect on us when we just come into his presence. Now, if you stop and think, you're going to be in the presence of someone. You're going to be in the presence of God, or you're going to be in the constant presence of this world. Now, we know that we're in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. We know we're going to be in the presence of the world. But, I do, but here's the question. Do I want more of God to rub off on me? Or do I want more of this world to rub off on me? Which one? Well, if that's the fact, if that's the case, then our exposure to God has to be, if I can use this word, intentional. In other words, we have to make the time to spend with God and to be in his presence. And if not, I will guarantee you that it's going to be the world that's going to have more of an impact on you than God, true or false. Because there's really only two choices in that capacity. So we have to be intentional about being exposed to God. And then, of course, he talked about those Attributes that are communicable, those that he shares with us, those things are the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And, and we see that fruit of the Spirit being that love, that peace, that temperance, that joy, that meekness, goodness, long-suffering, all of those. And due to the fact that the Holy Spirit of God dwells within us, do you realize that the Holy Spirit would love nothing more than for all of those attributes to be displayed by you on a regular basis. True or false? But why aren't they on a regular basis? What would be the one thing that would keep those attributes from being displayed on a regular basis? We know the answer. Because it's been the same theme throughout the beginning of man. And it comes down to this. Are we going to simply obey God or not obey God? Are we going to grieve the Holy Spirit with our actions and attitudes and thinking? Are we going to quench the fire and the work of the Holy Spirit? And, and, and here's the thing. When we do, you will not see these attributes come through. 
That's the cause and effect of what we're talking about here. So when we're talking about changed into his image, this really becomes a new way of thinking, a process for us to say, I have to have God as the preeminent of my life daily. But can I tell you, that's tough, isn't it? That's really tough. I'm with you. I'm, I'm a part of the homo sapien group as well. It's tough. And as humans, can I tell you, we tend to get in the way. Our humanity, our flesh tends to get in the way so much. And we constantly have to, have to just completely come back to say, Lord, I've got to die to self and let you be in charge and let you take control in order for us to ever come to the point of being changed into his image. That's the only way it works. But can I tell you this? It comes down to simply a choice. It's really that simple, is it not? It's a choice. Am I going to choose to do this on a daily basis, to have those attributes, to live this particular way from that standpoint? We, we can, I'll just go from there. From the communicable attributes, we talked about this real quick. Uh, it's just like the tea bag from chapter one. I'm not going to go back and, and hit those all over again. There was a couple of verses. Uh, this is not one of them yet, but we'll, there is a couple of verses. One of them came from 2 Corinthians 3.18. Um, let me just read it for you. you can, if you want to turn there, you can. Matter of fact, this is one of those you might just want to either highlight or even put an asterisk out beside it. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Just go ahead and jo- if you want to turn there. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's also in your book there if you want to read it out of your book, but if you've got your Bible right there handy. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Somebody get there and if you would uh, maybe read it. Josh, are you there? Yes, sir. Would, you, would you read it for me there, Josh, real loud so everybody can hear? But we all, with the open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Think about that verse and, and, and what is it really saying there? But we all, with an open face, this open face, what does it mean when he talks about an open face? Sometimes we see those words and we go, okay, what does that mean? How about with this? How about an unobstructed view? There's nothing blocking our view with an open face. You see my face, I see your face. There's nothing that obstructs that view, right? That's what he's saying. But we, with an unobstructed view, an open face, beholding. What's that word beholding in the Old English? What's that word behold mean? We see this. What? Real loud. To look. To look. We are behold. We are looking into this glass. And what does it see? What is it that we see in this glass? Also, this word glass is also the word what? It's the word mirror. So it's just like you and I, when we get up in the morning and you go in and you look in the mirror and then you, some of you scream and you... Uh, or some of you go, is that really me? I've done that for years now. But the bottom line is you, you look into that mirror, you're beholding, you're seeing that face of yours. But you know what? That's a wonderful thing to see the face, isn't it, Joel? Why? Why is it a wonderful thing to be able to see your face as God's talking about here? There you go. Because when you look deeply... You can see the faults that you need to fix. My hair is standing up. You know, I need to shave. You know, have no hair. Wish you had. But the bottom line, you know, there's all these things you see and you go, there's things fixable and not fixable. But think about this from a spiritual standpoint. We look into that mirror, but what do we see? We not only see us, but there's something else that we see in this verse here. We see Christ. When we look into the mirror of God's word, that's what it's talking about. The mirror here is referring to God's word. When we look into the mirror of God's word, we see Christ, we see us, we're able to see where we need to fix things, and we're able to see the image that we need to become more like. Man, what a plan. 
It's all in one shot. There it is. And, we're ch and when we begin to change those things in our life, we become the same image from glory to glory, even the Spirit of the Lord. It's all there. It's all packaged in one place. Everything that we've been talking about up to this point is packaged in that one verse. But the failure is that when we see those things, and we refuse to do anything about it. There's another word for that, by the way, isn't there, Kevin? It's called what? Rebellion. It's called disobedience. When we see those things or when we see those things that God wants to show us and we have no intention of doing anything about it. How silly is that? When the Holy Spirit of God is just simply wanting that which is best for us. So we see that in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And the whole point of this is that we would simply be changed into His glory. That's what all this is about. And, and, and we come to this point here, and I'll kind of rush through this, but one of the statements out of the book is this, and, and, and so due to the fact that the slides are a little bit, let me just read it to you. It says, God's glory is a manifestation of his many splendored excellencies. So when we talk about these attributes that we saw, those non-communicable, those communicable attributes, that word manifestation, by the way, it means to be made known openly. So God's glory is made known openly to each of us through his many splendored excellencies. What is the word excellency? The attributes. Now I want to stop and ask you a question. Has this been the true in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament? How is it that the children of Israel came into the presence of God in the Old Testament? How did God come and present himself before them? What was, how did he do that? In the temple, okay? And then specifically in the temple where, Pastor Lucas? The mercy seat of God. And above the mercy seat of God, once that took place and the temple was completed and the Ark of the Covenant was in there and the veil was put in and the staves were removed and the prayers and the incense began to go up, immediately God's glory showed up in the Shekinah glory of God. Boom. There he is. All of that, does that mean that God, that was the only place that he dwelt? No. You can't contain God in, in the temple. You can't contain God even upon the whole earth. He's everywhere. But that was just a representation to say, I am here with you. But not anybody could just come into the presence of that Shekinah glory of God, could they? But when they did come into the presence of God, it changed them. And in a miraculous way. We talked about this last week about how with Moses... When he spent time with God on Mount Sinai, he came down off that mount after 40 days. It's, people looked upon him like, whoa, your face is absolutely glowing. Had to put on a veil so that people could look at him from this standpoint because they had known beyond a shadow of a doubt. What's the one thing they could say about Moses at that point? He had spent time with God. Amen? But now, see, we, we don't refer to the Shekinah glory of God at this point, but in the New Testament, God doesn't have to give the Shekinah glory of God. He's given something better in this case. What? Huh? The Holy Spirit of God that dwells with us. Now, I want you to stop and think about something for a second. How many of you, when I talk about the Shekinah glory of God, get all excited and go, oh. Wow, you know, if we just had the Shekinah glory of God, and man, let's just imagine all of a sudden it just kind of just fills this whole room right here upon the altar and all of us would go, oh! right? We would, wouldn't we? But do we get that excited about that same spirit 
that dwells within us as born again believers now because it's the same spirit. When's the last time you thought about it that way? Puts a whole new perspective on it, doesn't it? But when we allow that spirit to work in and through us, what happens? Well, I'll tell you what should happen. People should look at us the same way they looked at Moses. True or false? And say, oh, he has been in the presence of God. Because the presence of God is in me. See, folks, that's bringing it down to where we live, isn't it? That's about as practical as we can get. But the reason that we don't always see that in our lives is we get in the way too much of that spirit in the flesh and the world. And we begin to quench and even to simply just disobey the spirit of God. <clears throat> and then, of course, God is not going to work through a vessel in that capacity. But the truth of the matter is this. We said this last week. No one exposed to the glory of God will ever remain the same. Let me say that again. No one ever exposed to the glory of God will ever remain the same. Fact. Truth of the matter is God tells us all the time. As you will draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. The, the sadness about that is He's as nigh as he can get since he dwells within us. <laughs> we just need to make sure that we're allowing him to work in and through this. Which brings us to this verse that just disappeared. It brings us to all these slides that weren't there before. <laughs> that Matt fixed while I wasn't looking. I... I know, he fixed these, he's working behind the scenes and fixing them. But Matthew chapter 16 says this, verses 13 through 17. Read the verse there. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. What did he say? For fl flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but that which is of heaven. And then the very next verse in Luke yeah, 24 verses 40. This is the, this is the this is the episode on the road to Emmaus, Emmaus with the tw uh, two that had just been with Christ after the death, burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these are some of the very first two that were in His presence after that resurrection. And there for a while, even as they walked with Jesus, did not realize who it was. But all of a sudden, there was a point to where they became illuminated. So this whole chapter here is talking about this aspect of, of being illuminated, just like Simon Peter. Do you think that was, he, Jesus told him, you're not able to answer that thou art the son of the living God. You're not able to answer that thou art the Messiah if it had not been told to you from my heavenly father above. Through the Spirit. You wouldn't have known that of your own self. You wouldn't have known that of flesh and blood. So the Spirit comes in and one of the mighty works of the Holy Spirit is this aspect of illumination. We think of all the work that the Holy Spirit does within us. How He convicts us of sin and judgment and righteousness. And, and how He gives us strength and power to do those things which we ought to be doing in the name of Christ and to live for Christ and to have eternal life and to have, you can think of all these things, but there's another ma a major uh, work of the Holy Spirit, the work of illumination. You know, it's the one that takes place, then if you were like me when you were saved at 22 years of age and 22 and before I read the Bible and got nothing out of it. It was words. It was black and white words on a page. But the moment that I accepted Christ in July of 1986, and when the Holy Spirit of God began to work, all of a sudden, as I opened the Bible and read, it's like, Bang! man, 
the Bible became alive. The words were alive. The words moved me. The words instructed me. Illuminated by the power of the Holy Spirit to help me to be all that God would have me to be. And all of a sudden to start understanding. So this aspect of illumination is nothing more than when God turns the lights on. Yeah. Now, I'm not, I'm not, for time's sake, I'm not going to get all sidetracked, okay? Because there's, there's entire groups, denominations out there, who they take that statement right there when God turns the lights on, and they run with it in an entirely different direction of what it was ever intended to be. Guys like Calvinism. So that's all as far as I'm going to say. I came out of a very hyper-Calvinistic background. And I will tell you, that term right there meant something entirely different than what we see the, the true scripture says about it. But enough said. When God turns the lights on, God's spirit must personally show the realities of God to man. Think about that. What do we know about God? We only know about God what he wants us to know about him. Desires for us to know about him. But how does that illumination of God come about? When his spirit begins to come into communication with our spirit and to work and we are able to understand. And then, of course, in your, in your book there, if you read chapter 7. By the way, let me just ask a question. How many of you read chapter 7? How many of you being nice and how many of you obeying? How many of you? Okay. Okay. So how many, I'm not asking how many you have it. But the bottom line is, if you would have read through your book, you would have come across this whole section on being tanned by the sun. You know, some people go to Florida this time of year, spring break, just so they can lay out there and get fried like a lobster on the, on the beach somewhere to come back to be an absolutely excruciating pain for the next month to say, look at me, ah! But, by, but you know what happens. After an amount of time, the sunburn goes away and everything else because they were no longer exposed to the blinding heat of the sun. But if you wanted that burn to turn into a tan and that tan to stay that nice golden bronze, you would have to stay in complete exposure to the sun on a regular basis. We know that. What a truth. If we're ever going to have that, can I use this terminology, that tan of God? We have to stay in the exposure of God on a regular basis in order to continue to have that. It's not something we, oh, by the way, that tan, can I just lovingly say this? It's not something that we do to ourselves. It's just the result of us being in the exposure of the sun. The same is true with, with our walk of godliness and, and, our, and this being changed into his image. It's not something that we do. Listen, can I, I've said this before, but we need to make sure we correct an error in some of our Christian thinking. We did not get saved by any works. Amen? Amen. None. We do not get sanctified by any works either. Some of you weren't so quick to say amen. Sorry. <laughs> but is it true or not? Our salvation came about by faith and faith only. Amen? Amen? Our sanctification comes about by faith and faith only. Amen. It's not something we do. This, this, this tan of God is not something we work up. It's not some lotion that we put on that turns us orange. It's, it's basically us being in complete exposure to the things of God. Daily. Christ likeness is the same thing. In order for us to truly become conformed to the image of Christ, we must spend time in his presence. We must spend time in his word. We must spend time ob simply obeying the Spirit of God. And the evidences of exposure, the evidences, I'll run through these real quick. When we are in this exposure to God, this illuminated truth will actually begin to move us intellectually. Hey, you know what? It begins to change our thinking about the things of God. 
when we come into complete exposure to him. It changes our thinking. I don't know about you, but I had some pretty warped thinking about being raised in a hyper-Calvinist background for many, many years. And some of that thinking really needed to be corrected. Amen? What was the only thing that was going to correct that ill behavior or some of that ill thinking? Exposure to the Word of God. Exposure to truth. And to allow that truth to replace some of that error. That's the only thing. I would venture to say that some of us carry some baggage from some old thinking, maybe from our past lives. And we need to allow the Word of God to saturate even our minds to clear out some of that thinking that may not be 100% correct by the Word of God. Amen. Truth is that it does. It illuminates the truth intellectually. And illuminated truth moves us emotionally. When we begin to see those things of God and those attributes, we cannot but just... Uh, we cannot be, uh, but be moved to say, oh, wow, God, you're so great. This aspect of praise, this aspect of the, even the word hallelujah. And, and when, we, when we come into his presence, we cannot but help to praise God, even emotionally. You ever get emotional sometimes when you, you read through a verse or you sing a song? Now listen, listen, be careful, be careful. Ready? Because there's a whole group out there that wants to put emotion as the primary driver in this. For instance, praise and worship music. Praise and worship music is, is, is solely meant to move you emotionally. But be careful, be careful, be careful when in some cases there's like zero doctrine in some of that music that they repeat 7-Eleven, seven times over, whatever. I, I, I sung a song last Sunday. It was in a church I visited, and, and they had some of that. And you sing this, uh, this chorus so many times, you feel like you're going into a coma. <laughs> I'm like, I can see how you, yeah, once you get me hypnotized, and once you get me in that coma, you can probably get me to do anything you want. I, I filled up the tide plate three times <laughs> in that coma. <laughs> I'm sorry. Where did I go with that? <laughs> Illuminated truth moves us volitionally. It means it gets us to act upon that which we know with an aspect of urgency, with an aspect of responsibility. Urgency. Hey, is Jesus Christ coming back? Yes. When's he coming back? When he wants to be done. Soon. He's coming back soon. Does that move you to any urgency whatsoever? Does that move you to tell people about Jesus Christ? Does that move you to live in such a way to where people see Christ in you? That's what it means when it says it moves us volitionally. We now have an urgency about the things of God because we've been exposed to the truth. And then, of course, it all has to depend on what's your view of God. What is your view of God? We kind of finished with that, but it... He talks about the right diagnosis in your, in your book. We've got to have the right diagnosis. You go to the doctor, you see that you've got an ailment. You hope and pray he gives you the right diagnosis the first time. Right, Miss Kim? And when he gives you the right diagnosis, then he can help give you the right remedy. That's what God wants us. We have to have the right diagnosis about us, about God, and then the remedy. And the truth of the matter is, our view of God is, is of utmost importance if we are to live victoriously for Him. Now, I want to just, that's kind of the end, but I want, I want to share with something. There is one thing in this book that I thought was really, really cool at the end of this chapter. And I'm only going to take a minute just to share it with you. Because sometimes we pass over the uh, making disciples and all the other stuff, a word to disciple makers in your book. We kind of gloss past those at the end of each of the chapter. But this chapter you can't. Because there is a chart on page 161 in your book. If you don't have your book, just jot it down. Page 161. That is absolutely a must for you to go back and look at. And the reason is, whether you are raising your children, whether you're, you're living in your household, whether you're helping with grandparents, I don't care what stage of life you're in, you have to ask this question real quickly here. Do, you, do any of you have standards in your household, yes or no? 
How did you come about to arrive at those standards? Did you arrive at the standards because mom and dad instilled with you that those are the standards you should have? Did you arrive at those standards because that's what the church said to do? Or did you arrive at those standards based on your exposure to God? And when we start reading through our Bible, becoming exposed to God, we're going to come into contact with God's attributes, communicable or non-communicable. And when we come in contact with those attributes, all of a sudden we see something happen in Scripture. It's through those attributes that God either gives us a command or he gives us a principle. For instance, he said, thou shalt not kill. That one's an easy one. But when he says, but, but what about the aspect that um, even from the standpoint I'm to be sober minded or I'm to uh, not to look upon even uh, the drink and its movement or all the different things that I see about drink. You know, nowhere do I ever see that God says thou shalt not drink alcohol. You don't see that written, do you? But do you think there's enough principle in there to where we should restrain from drinking any alcohol at all? Yes or no? Yes. So is that a good solid principle based on his attributes? Yes or no? Yes. Is it enough to convict us yes. to say, I personally am under conviction. I do not believe that I should be drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. And is that conviction enough to move that into a standard into your life? See, that's how it's supposed to work. I got to tell you, sometimes I think we need to go back and review stuff like this and, and challenge ourselves to ask ourselves, the standards that I have in my life, where do they come from? And then also, are there things based on the attributes of God that should be standards in my life to help keep me where I should, <coughs> between the guardrails? There's enough, whether it's the, and so many times, I don't know, i got to stop, but so many times we get into these arguments about, well, you know, God didn't specifically say not to do this or not to do that, but is our, is our temple, is our body the temple of the Holy God? Should we be doing anything to devile that temple? Now, people are going to be drawing different lines all across the basis of where that is based on what they become convicted under and based what standards they apply to their lives. And to anybody who applies any standards, I say, amen. Now, your standards may not always be the exact same as mine, but we're not competing against each other. That's the whole point. That's our Christian liberty. But you better be going back and basing it on the right things. That's what I can tell you. And starting with the attributes of God, being exposed on a regular basis to his word, will help you go a long way in that area. Amen? Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you would just help us as we become more and more exposed to you, that you would help us to draw close to you, and that you would just allow us to be all that you would have us to be, ultimately changed into the very image of God. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.